Welcome to the 10th anniversary of the Clinton School. I'm Skip Rutherford. I'm dean of the school. Uh, last night when we had Ernie Green here, I asked everyone to turn their cell phones off, and Ernie told them to turn them back on. So please silence your cell phones, but if you'd like to tweet and whatever, you can do that. Um, we're honored to have you today. This should be a fun and interesting panel group. If you will notice some of the participants, quite colorful, and we will have a good time. I'd like to welcome the president of the University of Arkansas System, Dr. Don Bobbitt, and his wife, Susan, who are with us. And the vice president for academics for the University of Arkansas System, Dr. Mike Moore. We have several Clinton School alumni who are here. Tomorrow night, we will have an alumni reception. It will be the largest collection of Clinton School alumni in the history of the school in one place at one time. All 10 classes for the first time uh, represented from all 10 classes together. But let me point out one who's by far traveled the longest distance to be here. Uh, he is, uh, the, when, as a student here, he won the school's top award, the Shannon Butler Bridge Builder Award, and he has arrived for these festivities from a pretty well-known place in the world called Ukraine. So please welcome Anatoly Shotkovsky from Ukraine. <laughs> 10 years ago, the nation's first Masters of Public Service program opened. It was on November 18th, 2004. You remember it as the day of rain. <laughs> we seem to always bring bad weather. This time I'm not in charge of it this weekend, so I can't claim uh, blame. But um, while everyone focused that day on the opening of the Clinton Library, it was actually the opening of the Clinton School too. Starting a process that led to the admission of the first class in August of 2005, and the graduation of the first class in December of 2006. So from the period 2014 to 2016, we will be celebrating the 10 years. Ours will stretch it over three years and have a lot of activities planned. Um, in the 10 years, uh, our students, our faculty, and our staff have built a lot of bridges. And they have uh, over 500 and 70 projects all over Arkansas, America, and the world. Um, done some incredible things, and our graduates are doing some incredible things. By education standards, 10 years isn't a very long time. But in terms of the, the, the results and the outcomes that these students, this faculty, and this staff done, it's been quite remarkable. And it has been and continues to be a fun ride. In the fifth year of our school, we ask student David Watterson, who graduated from Berkeley College of Music and who is now with Music National Service in San Francisco, to write what we would call the Clinton School alma mater. It's not your typical alma mater. It has sort of become the Clinton School song. And we have played it at various occasions. It, it is. It is a, a very uh, wonderful piece that David wrote, a tribute to his great musical ability. And uh, it is all about building bridges. Uh, I encourage you, we're going to play it right now to start the program, I encourage you to listen to the words that he wrote. And when you think it's over, it's not. There's a second part. So just wait till it's over. So this is David Watterson's We Will Build a Bridge.
David Watterson, class of 2011. Now I invite the panel to, uh, to come out. And for those that were here, Ruth, Mike, when Dr. Bruce was academic dean, this is the way, this is the way he gathered people in the lobby. This is the way he broke up orientation sessions. These are Dr. Bruce's bells that I have kept for 10 years. So Dr. Bruce, we ring for your honor. Our panelists today are Pat Torvastat, who was Director of Planning and Development for the University of Arkansas System when this idea started. Next to Pat is the well-known Clinton School Director of Administration, Diane Kelly, who was here on day one and who has more stories about us and for us than anybody in this building. Next to Diane is the person who runs the public programs. For the first time, he is now going to be on the public program <laughs> because he was the first intern at the Clinton School when he was a student at Hendricks College. Uh, and as you all know, and as I've said many times, now runs the nation's best college speaker series. And, And then the founding academic dean, who also was instrumental in the founding of UAMS's College of Public Health, Dr. Tom Bruce. So the first question, this will feel like Jeopardy or something. The, the first question goes to you, Pat. And, and, and I want to ask because this is part of a story that has really not been told in detail about the founding of the Clinton School. I want you to talk about, if you can, I want you to talk about the politics of the campuses, how you put together a system school, uh, not on a college campus, something very different from traditional academic models. How did you navigate the politics of Arkansas academia. Pat Torbis. Oh, that's a, just an easy question. Uh, well, I plan to. Can you hear me without this? No, you got to do the Okay, can you hear me? Um, I, the first thing that happened was that I was at UAMS and uh, Dr. Sugg called and talked to Harry Ward about the fact that he had received a letter giving the presidential library to uh, Central Arkansas for physical location and that the academic programs, whatever those might potentially be, would be to the system and it would be the system's responsibility to design them in a way that benefited the state and benefited the other institutions in the University of Arkansas system. So um, what, what I think it's 17 years ago, uh, and yesterday when I was looking through all the things that I had stashed, couldn't even find them, um, I thought about um, where we started, which was, um, what's a presidential library? I mean, did anybody 17 years ago know how many there were and how they got built and what was in them? I mean, the, the, the lack of information was not just on us, it was everywhere. So we had to figure out what a presidential library was first, and then what would it look like? I mean, this is a broad question. What would it look like to have an academic affiliation? And so the Kennedy School of Government, oh no, that's not at the Kennedy Library. Um, and the Ford Museum is not with the Ford Library, and, and Emory doesn't have much of a relationship with the Carter. We begin to, to try to, to take the whole universe and then narrow it down. And um, we had kind of a challenge because uh, Dr. Sugg and the system office saw themselves, we saw, and I was new, so this was all kind of new to me, as um, a kind of an administrative unit, not to be too big, not to be too cushy, and to allow the different institutions to govern themselves and the idea that something would 
would be created at the University of Arkansas System Office that was a, um, had a curriculum potentially was, that was just kind of anathema. It, we, were, we were supposed to have lawyers and finance and, and, and get problems solved, but get out of the way of academic programs and faculty. So, and there were other things that had gone on. Um, thank goodness we had great help. And one of the people that just navigated uh, for three years was Diane Blair. And uh, she was so close to the Clintons. She was so close to Fayetteville. She was so respected. And uh, she was, her advice probably saved um, many, many um, disasters. Joyce Roten was a savvy, savvy politician. She actually got the grant from uh, the legislature, the planning grant that gave us a little bit of money to run on. Um, but uh, we had to go up and visit with Diane and talk with uh, Fayetteville because they had submitted a really, really worthy proposal to have the library up there. And they had an idea that, um, that there was a, a really wonderful set of ideas put together. Uh, when the decision was made, we needed to be respectful that the flagship university um, had a lot of talent in their faculty and had a lot of interest in the post-presidency initiatives that would take place now, you know, either virtually with Fayetteville or would be basically in Little Rock. So we, we established, um, we did our research on what, what, were the, what were the possibilities. Then we established a steering committee at each campus uh, of the three master's degree granting campuses because uh, along the way, and it didn't take us too long, we realized that for the university and for Arkansas to fulfill its, its highest potential of the relationship that, that uh, President Clinton was, was the gift of this library, uh, we had to have something that would matter to them and that would take advantage of, of all of the talent that we had but it wasn't easy. Um, and getting, uh, getting the best out of the campuses of, of, and still uh, having them participate and get excited about it, that just took, uh, I'm not a very patient person, and uh, that was really, really hard work. But, you know, basically I spent five years uh, deciding with people what how they wanted to do it, and there's a lot of you here today who were working on it. Um, and even just the concept, um, it was funny, I wrote down in my notebook, Clinton School of Public Service in July of 1997. So between January and July, that, that kernel of not public affairs, not public um, policy, activist, except that was not a good word, so you had to say action-oriented, <laughs> practitioner-based, because the word activist, um, well, what are you doing? You know, what are you gonna do over there? Um, so we wanted it to be, um, to, to reach out and make a difference, and one of the things that, the themes, I guess what I wanna wrap it up is, uh, there were a lot of politics internally, um, that were solved by a lot of conversations and a lot of respect for different opinions. And I, you know, I, I, I talk a whole lot and sometimes the listening, you know, seek first to uh, understand and then to be understood seemed to, I got a lot of good advice. I got, Alan was patient um, and there were people like Ron Copeland who did the initial research, because I'm not going to put together a book that surveys every possible way you could approach the presidential library and its academic uh, components. But the, um, the patience that it took ended up with everyone celebrating um, the, the opening and seeing that it was not a threat and that this school could bring a luster to the university system. So it, you know, um, five years later when I went back to UAMS and we had Dr. Bruce, uh, 
It was just smooth sailing. It was just effortless. But the, the, the point is, it's always, there's always a struggle. There are always internal and external politics. But um, my goodness, uh, to see that some of these same thoughts of using Arkansas as a lab to solve problems that exist worldwide, to see these students in ever-growing numbers and in ever-growing uh, ability to make a difference, that's what that's what we wrote at the very beginning, was uh, to take the, the public service mindedness of uh, President and Mrs. Clinton and, and turn this uh, school into something that they would be proud of and would, would be consistent with their, their um, philosophy of life. So I think, you know, it just was a wonderful ride. Well, no one could have navigated the internal politics between the campuses and this attitude that there can be a school through the University of Arkansas system that serves all of Arkansas. No one could have done that better than Pat Torvastad. So you, you did. And, uh, Doc, Dr. Bruce, you were here and helped put together the original curriculum, which quite frankly, the foundations and basis of that curriculum still remain strong today. How did y'all do that? Depended entirely on the work that Pat uh, Torvastat uh, had done uh, uh, during those uh, early uh, few years. Um, and, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the people at the uh, top of the administrative uh, thing, I was called the Dean Pro Tem uh, for the first year that I was here. Um, you'd think that uh, cr planning the curriculum uh, and uh, doing the teaching would be a part of my responsibilities. In fact, that had been done uh, uh, very well uh, by some of the early pre-planning, uh, and so my job was to sort of get us over the hump. Uh, how does one actually finally begin to put together something that gets the approval of the Board of Trustees, gets the approval of the Department of Higher Education in the state, uh, begins to get some level of funding? Uh, and uh, I began this whole thing uh, actually by accident uh, because uh, at, at a fundraising meeting of the Clinton Foundation uh, in the fall of uh, 2002, uh, I was seated for some reason right next to President Clinton. Uh, and we talked about all the kinds of things of AIDS in Africa, this, that, and the other. And finally, he said to me, uh, what's going on at the university? He says, I've been trying to get the library and to gather to start a school, and the university just doesn't kind of get its act together, and, and I'm really disappointed in the fact that it's not moving forward. So I talked to Joyce Roten, who had been working with me uh, on putting together the school, uh, the uh, public health school, uh, and she said, you've got to tell the university president that, uh, Alan Sugg, he needs to hear that President Clinton is not very happy with uh, how things are going in the university system. And so I did, and when I finally said it, we just don't have any money, we just, there, there's no funding, uh, there's a little bit of planning money left over, and, uh, but he finally said, well, you've put together a new School of Public Health, maybe you know how to take it forward in some way or another, and I said, well, let's start it on a shoestring. If we have to get it going, let's do it. And, uh, but, it was really uh, the work that Pat had done with her committees, in particular, I think the Curriculum Planning Committee had done a fabulous job during this period of time. Uh, there's a sort of a triangle, if you can think about it. Public administration is at the bottom of, the, of this triangle. Uh, and that is really about the efficiency of ways of thinking about public programs in some way or another. At the next level is public policy. That's really about effectiveness. Then at the very top is public service, which is really about equity. And this school is about all of those. It's about the efficiency, effectiveness, and the equity. And that one is the sort of peak and the, and the principle of what we were trying to put together. Uh, and therefore, the curriculum of this school had a modicum of basic coursework uh, to be given in the classroom. But the huge amount of learning was really to be done in the field. 
Uh, this was very much designed as a hands-on school. So that there were three public service projects. Uh, the first one, the first year of the school was entirely working in the Delta with communities uh, in public service events. And it was a group project. The students had to work together. The biggest thing that they had to learn is they could not just go into a community and say, okay, let's do this or that. That was not their community. They had to work with the people who there and they could bring ideas, they could bring uh, energy, they could build enthusiasm, uh, the bully pulpit was there, but ultimately, if there was no ownership of that within the community itself, uh, then nothing was going to happen because those students were going to leave. And therefore, this had to be a community project so that that was the most important thing that they had to learn from the very beginning is this is not our community. This, we're, help, we're here to help you. The second project at the end of the first year was the international project. They had uh, most often to go to a country they've never been, a language they couldn't speak, and carry out a public service project within that context. An enormous life-changing event for most of them. And then the third event was the capstone when they came back during the second year. Uh, this was the design was to be, since most of these were people who already had a fairly good education and background, they didn't know what to do with their life. They came here wanting to do something worthwhile for their careers, but they weren't sure what it was. So the, the public capstone project in the second year was a chance to do a project in a field that they thought they might like to do in the future, a beginning of a career. And then if they were successful, they were already started on that career by the time they finished their project. If they wasn't successful, they knew they needed to start over something else. So that the, this enormous investment in the sort of hands-on field experience of public service is in fact much of the essence of what this school is about. Thank you. The, and the work that Pat did, the work that you did, then it came down to really making it work, opening the doors, making sure things happen. There's a difference between what ought to be and what is. And Diane Kelly, as Director of Administrations and Operations, was responsible for that. Uh, Dr. Kelly, would you please uh, give us your thoughts about the opening of the school, how you did it, uh, and any, uh, uh, any reflections about that? Well, we didn't need a moving van because we didn't have anything to bring down here. I think most of you will remember there was a picture of Senator David Pryor in the Democrat Gazette carrying his own papers in the front door with a box, in a banker's box. But uh, the first trip, Dr. Bruce and I had been together for a year and a half before we actually moved down here. And our first trip down here was in my husband's pickup truck with 14 folding tables we borrowed from the student union at UAMS. Now the boys over there were nice enough to put them in the truck, but when we got down here it started raining and there was no one but us. <laughs> and we actually carried those in here all by ourselves. And on the way back, it had not rained in months, and we, just, we came on 6.30 and we decided to go back down 3rd Street and then Markham and where it makes that curve, even though I was driving very carefully and very slowly, Dr. Bruce will have to say, <laughs> my husband's brand new truck left the road and went over into the blind or deaf school, whichever one is the first one, it was flying through the air and it stopped right before that big concrete pole that's holding up the pedestrian walkway. And he said, are you okay? And I turned around and I said, I've almost killed a saint because, I mean, you know how many awards and recognitions Dr. Bruce, I mean, has received, and I almost killed him. I never have gotten over that, but he's still going strong at 84. No, nope, he's 83. Let me ask you this. I want, I want the story or the okay. myth of the grand opening of this mm -hmm. library and school. Is it true that Barbara Streisand was in your office and you were supervising her? Yes, we got down here at 4.30 the morning of the big rainstorm, and uh, all the celebrities started coming in here because of the rain. And 
Barbara Streisand and her husband James Brolin came in, and I know you've all read, she's very, very, very shy. And she just couldn't handle all the people out here. So I took her around to my office, and she sat in the straight chair, and James Brolin sat in my desk for like two hours. And I would go in there every once in a while and check on them, and uh, they were just really lovely people. He and I, he said, you come sit down and get your computer on. Let's look at the rain band. Let's, let's, let's see if it's going to stop Let's don't raining. look at the rain band. Yeah, and it was. It was. So that was a pretty exciting day. All right. One of the things that David Pryor started as, as dean is he brought Senator Bob Dole in as the first speaker. Uh, and then over time, more people came. Um, one of the responsibilities was that was, a, was the young uh, intern from Hendricks who was working on that and who uh, never left. Uh, and uh, so, Nikolai, would you take us through the evolution of what I think has been a, a remarkable gift um, to the people of Arkansas and to the people of Central Arkansas with this speaker series that's free and open to the public that you have, uh, you know, done some great stuff. But take us through it. When you have time for Q&A, ask Diane the story that DP tells, uh, that David Pryor tells about that Barbara Streisand story. How David tells it. Right. Yeah, he it's tells a little it, bit different. He tells so it differently. So first, I want to apologize for not being David Pryor. I know many of you may be confused at this, uh, and so I do apologize for that. Um, but when, when I left as an intern and went back to school and came back, Dr. Bruce was kind enough to, to take a meeting with me before I graduated and said, sure, you can come on for the summer, um, help us with our interns now, study for the LSAT, go to law school, and, and be done with, with us. And about two weeks later, um, after I started, Skip moved me from that position to the programming position. Um, he had been visiting at Harvard to do a, a panel and was walking through the campus and saw these flyers about this world-renowned professor teaching at this class at this time and this Nobel laureate at this class all on one day. And he said, we may not be able to do three or four of them in one day, but let's do three or four of them in a week. And let's go from doing six or eight, like a typical college lecture series, and do 120, 125. <laughs> I don't think that was the number that he thought. He just gave uh, Patrick Kennedy and I kind of leeway to, to do what we could um, to raise the awareness of the school. And so that was what we, we took it on. We, we decided this was a way for us to get um, earned media, to, to get our name out into the public, to get all of you to come to us. Uh, we were a, a student body of 16. No one really knew what we were doing. and and so. We said, let's have the students introduce the speakers. Let's have them talk about the projects that they're doing. So every time giving the public a chance to come to here, start a dialogue within the community about what we were doing, as well as to give the students this unprecedented interaction with, with world leaders. So they get chances to interact with them after the events, before the events. Last night, Ernie Green from Little Rock Nine spent an hour with 20 of our students completely um, by themselves and, and, and so that type of being able to learn from them but also being diverse enough to where it's not 120 of the same thing um, and so that was kind of what we've done we're now over 940 um, events in, in since 2005 um, over 150,000 people have attended over 150,000 have watched them online so that was another way for us to get this out so we just want people to get this content be able to communicate with it and use it for however they can Okay, so you've gotten a little overview of the start, although Pat was very delicate in the politics of, of the University of Arkansas, and we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> Dr. Bruce was uh, not taking enough credit for his work in developing the, the first couple of years of the curriculum, which, by the way, Dean Hoffpower and the faculty uh, have modified and strengthened uh, after uh, getting the results back from our alums and our faculty and seeing how it could be changed. The curriculum has expanded from 36 to 40 hours. Uh, and, uh, but it builds on the same premise that, that, that Dr. Bruce and the original team started. Um, Diane um, undersold her efforts because this place couldn't have opened without her. Uh, 
there was just no doubt about it. She did, she carried every job, did everything, and worked long, long hours to make sure that details were done. And of course, Nikolai, as you know, is 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 clearly um, um, the leader of what I think is something very, very special. So now, in the planning and in the in your time at the Clinton School. So you can think about this, because I'm going to let Diane go first. Everybody else can think about it. What's your favorite or funniest moment during your time at the Clinton School? Which you can tell. <laughs> or planning. You get to tell about planning, Pat. Well, I'll quickly tell about my very first day at the Clinton School. Dr. Bruce hired me and forgot I was coming, and the door was locked, and I couldn't get in. Do you remember that, Dr. Bruce? <laughs> I didn't find him until about 9.30. He had gone to a meeting over at UAMS, so that was pretty funny. Uh, I always remember our orientation fish fry that we had for the first class of 16. It was 107 degrees that day. I don't think it had we ever it, been. We did it in the shade, though. Yes, we did it in the shade. We did it. Nikolai planned this, and then he had to go back to college and dumped it in my lap. But <laughs> Dr. Bruce, we hired uh, this uh, catfish place, and this poor man fried catfish for 125 people out here in a truck in the 107 degrees. And Dr. Bruce, I think their normal dessert was fried pies. And since he had just come to us from the College of Public Health, he said, we have to have ice cream. We can't have fried pies. Now, 107 degrees and yes. we had ice cream. Skip, at that time, was still at Cranford Johnson and president of the foundation. But he came to our picnic and I had to go out and get this ice cream out of the freezer and take it out there. And I couldn't find my helpers. And finally, Skip pulled the ice chest and I handed people an ice cream sandwich or something. Of course, it was running all over them before they even finished it. But it was, that was, that was fun. And then the next morning, we had to get up at the crack of dawn and go to Petty Jean, where we were having our orientation at the Winrock Center. So we were all pretty tired. but. It was fun. Good memories. Nick? I was going to add to that. So that orientation we called Camp Clinton. And that was my job as the intern that year for, before we opened was to schedule Camp Clinton. And, and Pat, you talk, talked about some of the um, power struggles. But I was a 21-year-old kid, and everyone wanted a piece of that intern, of that orientation. So it was seven straight days. I think five of them were on the mountain, four of them were on the mountain, booked from eight in the morning until eight at night with people from all over. They went to all the campuses, they went to Fayetteville for a day, they went to UMS for a day. It was so much that I think by the end of it that we may have lost a couple of students <laughs> and, and, some back, and drastically scaled it back. And so it is no longer called Camp Clinton. And uh, I, I try not to remind everyone that that was my idea to do. <laughs> I was going to comment on, I think one of the first events that I did right out of um, college and starting was in 2006, and it was during the time of the H1N1, the bird flu epidemic that was happening. So we brought in this pandemic expert, Michael Olsterholm, and uh, he came and he spoke to a full house of you know, 110 people, which at the time was how many they told me you could fit in here, and I've now learned you can fit way more than that, you just let people come. and they find places in the back. Um, but he gives this very sobering <laughs> discussion on bird flu and how we're all completely unprepared and that there's nothing that we can do and that we should probably just go home. <laughs> and we had planned this beautiful reception in the back in the shade again in June. And Diane and I have some funny stories about that caterer, but we, <laughs> my first event, I've got all these things set up, people walk outside as if they just learned that this was their last week on earth. <laughs> and they just, just, some grab some water and just see you later. And it was not, it was not the to engaging in the discussion that we wanted to happen afterwards. It was, thanks, we're gonna leave now. Dr. Dr. Bruce, your most memorable or funniest or favorite moment? 
uh, in trying to get uh, money from the legislature, uh, we, uh, when David Pryor uh, and I were planning uh, the strategy for doing that, um, I uh, suggested to him that uh, one of the things we should not do is talk about something that the University Board of Trustees had approved uh, about a month or so before, which was, since we are uh, essentially an international school, tuition here uh, should not take the form that it does on mo most of the other university campuses, uh, because about a third of our students were from Arkansas, about a third from other parts in this country, and about a third were international students. But it seemed unfair to charge two-thirds of those students out-of-state tuition rates uh, if we are, in fact, an international school. And therefore, we had asked the Board of Trustees to approve the fact that, that there would be one tuition rate that would be for everybody. Uh, this had been a sensitive issue, however, with the legislators. Uh, and so when we went down to talk to the Joint uh, Council, uh, Legislative Council at the Capitol building, I reminded uh, Senator Pryor, then Dean Pryor, that uh, this is something that he really shouldn't bring up because uh, of, of the sensitivities. Uh, and he was waxing on this, that, and the other, and he finally came to the idea, and with great pride, he said, we're admitting everybody without any out-of-state tuition. I just like collapsed with the whole thing because I had only reminded him that and it was on his thinking about it and so he just blurted it out and lo and behold the state the members around the table stood up and applauded <laughs> <laughs> little that i knew about uh, his uh, impact and the whole thing but anyway life's most embarrassing moment i thought turned out pretty well after all <laughs> pat what do you remember wait for the mic get the mic yeah, these microphones are recording it I wrote, I wanted to say something that Skip had done for me because um, it was memorable. What happened in the map room that I got to go to at the White House? I don't know. They saw, was it uh, selecting the architects? Maybe or, it was, yeah. So um, my husband Bob was director of AmeriCorps and I was going back and forth to Washington and I knew there was something going on and I was itching, dying to get in there uh, because it had to do, and I thought, well, you know, it had to do with the school, and I didn't know how many people were going, so I pulled over and called Skip, and I was beating around the bush like, hi, uh, I'm here in Washington, and you know, anything going on? And he finally said, do you want to go? And I said, yes. And so he got me in, and that was, that was very, very tall cotton. But the funniest thing was our trip to, and, to the LBJ um, library. LBJ, as his, his closest friend and, and confidant, w was still there, and he took us on a tour. Harry you Middleton. remember about Harry the Middleton. bathroom? Yeah. He said that LBJ talked all the time and always wanted to have someone around to listen. So when they built the bathroom, they built it like with a mirror so that whatever he was doing, he could look out in the room outside the bathroom, like a living room, and continue his conversation <laughs> uninterrupted. <laughs> and it just it was just really funny to think what a gregarious guy he was and how what a wonderful opportunity it was to have those little stories about uh, former presidents. Tell the one about before you look at the, when we visited the, the Carter Library in Emory and about Dr. Sugg. Dr. Sugg. <laughs> Dr. Sugg was kind of squeamish. And um, they were very, very proud at the Carter Center of what Jimmy Carter had done in World Health. And one of the things that he had done was almost totally eradicate Guinea worm disease. So, you know, I came from UAMS. I'm, I'm a medical junkie. So I looked up what Guinea worm disease was, and we got back in the car, uh, Diane and Skip and, and uh, I, and Dr. Sugg said, well, that was certainly interesting. And I said, well, what's interesting is what is Guinea worm disease? And he said, <laughs> so I proceeded to tell him, and you know that it's a very, very 
nauseatingly gruesome disease and worms crawl out the soles of your feet and I was embellishing it and he said he said that's just more than I ever wanted to know. It almost, it almost killed the school because we always we had this, we had, all I could think about was getting worm disease. I told Pat, don't talk about any of that stuff anymore. Okay, now, Dr. Bruce, what, or any of you, what, what, what do you think in looking back over 10 years was the biggest challenge besides the money issue? What, what do you think has been the big, the big challenge of the school that, that we've had to overcome and, or, or deal with this is a school that had, still does have major national, international impact in public service. And um, so the uh, faculty that leads that discussion and training and so forth uh, becomes terribly important. Um, and when we began, because we had no money, we had no faculty. So how does one then begin to think about uh, moving that whole process forward with a group of high-risk students who uh, uh, by their very nature were, were entrepreneurial and, and somewhat gamblers in being the first students uh, in, in a new school. And I think that uh, the ability to have selected faculty from each of our three parent campuses, the very best of those teachers on those campuses to come and to give the uh, classes, to run the classes and to be uh, those initial teachers became the keystone in beginning to, to move this whole idea forward in terms of our being a school, uh, not just uh, a little program, but in fact a major uh, initiative from the very beginning. And uh, these were, were fabulous people. In addition to the three campuses, uh, we actually got Jay Barth from Hendricks to give the public policy uh, and social change course in the beginning. So we had a really good group of, of teachers from the very beginning. Uh, and it was, to me, the launching pad for the, what ultimately becomes uh, the, the need for uh, a prestigious faculty uh, that provides the leadership in the school for the long term. All right, now let's open it up for you all. Let's, we have questions uh, and we'll, uh, so yes, right here. Nikolai, I'd like to ask, um, over the years that you've been doing this, have you seen an, a shift in public interest as far as the speakers that you bring? The community has gotten pickier, is what I can say, uh, in the sense that we've become so successful at this that may not come to the one as many, and so the community will wait and, and kind of pick out some of the ones that are maybe a little bit higher name brand um, for the attendance-wise, but for actual t subject matter, it seems that food, um, anything food, whether it be how to cook food or sustainable food, and how to for nonprofits are a skill set of some sort for nonprofits are the two that have shifted more so in the in the recent. Yes, sir. We'll wait for him. Wait for the microphone. I think it would be very interesting and important to know about the uh, what happens after the graduates leave. I'd be, uh, would you tell something about the procedure whereby you keep in touch with uh, graduates, like for maybe a, uh, an alumni magazine? Where is Alex Thomas? And I'll let him answer that question. This is our director of alumni right there. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Alex Thomas, and I actually work on both sides of the funnel. I'm the director of admissions, so I work to recruit and enroll students, and I'm also uh, the director of alumni services, so I work with folks after they leave. And um, in recent years, we've really looked to put a more earnest effort into the very things that you're asking about in terms of setting up an alumni board, uh, setting up mechanisms where the school can connect, uh, the school and the students here connect back to alumni, but also vice versa, and that's something that we're 
in real time looking to, to further develop and, uh, and launch with uh, different mentorships, different connections, and, and things like that. We have alumni all over uh, the world, honestly. I, I like to say we draw in 360 degree of student and then we graduate 360 degree of student. All different ages, all different academic backgrounds, all different public service interest areas. And the largest grouping of alums that we have uh, are probably in the state of Arkansas still. And not all of them are from the state of Arkansas, but they move here, they plug into the city, they plug into uh, programs and causes and issues and people and they stay and they buy homes and, the, and they, they connect. But another big area for us is Washington, D.C. And that, that's becoming a pretty big area for us, too. We probably have 15 or more alums out there right now uh, working, some with the government, but others working with all different kinds of public service organizations just based out of D.C. Uh, beyond that, we honestly just have a sprinkling of alums here and there. Uh, all throughout the country, around the world, uh, in, in all different, different corners. But our alumni group is growing. We have about a couple hundred alumni now. When the school was founded uh, in that first year, as the, the panel suggested, there were 16 students in that first class. We're now consistently enrolling classes that are plus or minus 45 students. So we've, we've grown from the first year to now our, our 10th year. And right now with the two classes, we're a two-year program, so with the two classes, we have just around 100 students in the program, the first and second year uh, students together. Uh, so that's a far cry from those days of 16 students uh, back when we all when we all started. But, uh, but yeah, that's a little bit of, of information. And that's a good thing to point out is that we didn't, that we, the students here, about 20% of them get concurrent degrees either in public health through the, the, the Faye Bozeman School of Public Health at UAMS or law through the William H. Bowen School at UALR or Master's in Business Administration through the Sam M. Walton School, University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. So of the three uh, uh, advanced degree granting institutions, we have concurrent degree relationships with all of them. And so we will have students pursuing these concurrent degrees. In fact, some of the alums and people in the back of the room and here that I've seen are, are either doing that now or are completed doing that. So it's been a real interesting um, and, and in this year's class of 45 students, we had 33 different undergraduate majors, which is, again, ma makes the program unique. And Dr. Bruce, you will be pleased to know that every year we have to battle it, and every year we still pursue it, and tuition is the same regardless of wherever you are. So <laughs> that is also a 10-year tradition. Any other questions? Yes, Marilyn. So there's no reason I can't come to the next Clinton school as a student, you think? Uh, no, not in terms of, <laughs> there's no reason you, you, you wouldn't be eligible to come. Not sure you would be qualified to get in, Marilyn, but, <laughs> but, but I'm not on the admissions committee and therefore I won't make that decision. <laughs> okay, I'll be seeing you. Other questions? Yes, here's the, here's the student body president right here. This is Nathan Watson from the University of Arkansas president of the student body. Um, first off, thank you all for your work to uh, provide the opportunity to be a part of this program. Uh, myself and the 44 other students from class 10, I know, um, are really excited about the opportunities that accompany with going to the Clinton School. Um, as a student of a new program, I think that lots of us feel a responsibility to help define what it means to graduate with a master's in public service. Um, and do you have any um, advice for our pursuit and how you would like to see that be defined? When I first talked with President Clinton about what the school was about, his idea was that this was maybe a school that had major emphasis on elected officials. He wanted a, a, a training place for future governors, senators, uh, mayors perhaps, others elected office. Uh, and as we looked at it more broadly, it seemed to us that uh, public service, which is giving your life for the betterment of, of mankind and uh, of uh, uh, a career of dedication to others, 
wasn't limited to elected officials at all, but it in fact could be farmers, it could be teachers, uh, any other uh, dedicated professionals and so forth. And so um, uh, the diversity uh, of inclusion in the types of people who came into the class was uh, part of the discussion from the very beginning. Uh, but uh, how one uh, applies this whole concept uh, to uh, careers uh, is in fact uh, a big part of the, the progress, in fact, in learning uh, through the school itself. Uh, and one of the things that we did in the very beginning was uh, to hire uh, some people who were really good at that kind of personal counseling and so forth. Bob Torbestat, uh, the husband of, of Pat here, uh, who had been an AmeriCorps person, became a full-time person working with students, thinking about those sorts of issues and, and planning. Uh, and we got people from uh, UALR, uh, and uh, so that um, uh, people like John Hill and Ruthie Kaplan, uh, who had been uh, provide, talking about careers all their lives with students and, and in their future, uh, became members of this faculty in the beginning uh, to help work through many of those other options. And that kind of in-depth, ongoing discussion and dialogue during the period of classroom work and uh, the uh, field experiences uh, became, I think, a defining part of uh, how you began to settle into, so what does public service mean to me in terms of not only how I do it, but where I do it and, and the context uh, of the whole thing. So um, I think it's a growing experience for each student. It's an individualized experience, uh, and it's a part of the uh, exhilaration, in fact, of uh, the term and, and what it means to each of those who, who go through this experience. Well, thank you. And, and I want to say, you know, that, that, that each class, I mean, that, Older classes don't like me when I say this, but each class gets better, and that's what it should be. And uh, and this, uh, the 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 people that are attracted to this program, uh, the worst day of my life, by the way, is admissions day, and it's not because of the happiness of the people that gets in; it's for those that don't. And for many people, this is their school of choice because they want to get a master's degree in public service. So. On admissions day, I'm probably the only dean in America that throws up. But it is a, it is a great program. 85% graduation rate, which is really good, and an 85% career placement rate. And if you heard, and we'll, at some point we'll have it out, of all the jobs and the positions these students have, have it, it really is extraordinary. I want to thank President Clinton for having the idea and the vision of this. I want to thank. Um, Dr. Sugg, Dr. Bobbitt, University of Arkansas Board of Trustees, past and present, for believing in us. I want to thank Governor Huckabee, who, who provided early funding and support for this program. We wouldn't be here without him. I want to thank Linda Bean, the, who was then the director of the Arkansas Department of Higher Education, who, when it wasn't necessarily politically popular, she stood tall for us. And I will always remember that and, and, and never forget it. So I think the best days for the Clinton School are yet to be. Uh, we uh, uh, are looking forward to the next 10 years, and uh, we thank you all for coming, and we encourage you to visit with our students and our alums. Uh, there's some pretty remarkable young people. Thank you all very much.